Okay, okay. great. Uh, okay, I'll get started. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Long Zhou. You can call me Joe. Uh, a little bit background about myself. Uh, currently, I'm working at Bungie North America as a senior project leader. I'm also the vice chair of AOCS, Biotechnology Division. Today, I'm the coordinator of this webinar, which is also sponsored by a biotech division. Today, we're so glad to have Dr. Mary Newport as our speaker to review the his history of using ketones as alternative fuel for the brain and the therapeutic implication and the clinical trials of MCTs, which is a very hot topic recently, for Alzheimer's disease and mild uh, cognitive impairment. So a little bit of background of Dr. Mary Newport. Uh, she graduated from Shivey University and the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and is board certified in pediatrics and neonatology and the care of sick and premature newborns. She was funding medical director for two newborn intensive care unit in the Tampa Bay area in Florida, which is actually my favorite place for vacation, by the way. She currently makes home visit with people who has chronic conditions. In 2008, she implemented a ketogenic nutritional intervention with coconut and the medial chain triacylglycerol oil that dramatically helped her husband, Steve Newport, who had early onset Alzheimer's disease. He lost this battle in 2016, and Dr. Newport carried on his legacy as an author and an international speaker on ketone, ketones as an alternative fuel for the brain. So her latest book is entitled The Complete Book of Ketones, A Practical Guide to Ketogenic Diet and the Ketone Supplement. So if you have any questions about during the webinar, please type them into the chat box which you can see from the keto meeting, um, go to meeting, which is on the on the bottom. Uh, we will have time for questions and answers after the presentation. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Newport, for spending so much time with with us and put everything together and also sharing your knowledge with us. So I will turn it over to you now. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody that's here today. I really appreciate that. Um, so, um, uh oh, <laughs> okay, there we go. So I am, as you said, a neonatologist. That's a doctor that cares for sick and premature newborns. And I practiced in newborn intensive care units for 30 years. And my husband, Steve was an accountant, which worked great for our family. And he actually chose to work from home and, you know, took great care of us. But when he was only 51 years old, he developed symptoms uh, that turned out to be Alzheimer's disease. And as you heard, it does not have a happy ending. He did pass away in 2016 from Alzheimer's disease and turned out he also had Lewy bodies, Lewy body dementia as well. In 2016, he passed away. Um, but it does have a happy middle because we gained several extra good years that were better than the year before. Uh, the dietary intervention um, in the middle of uh, the course of his disease. So I will tell you more about his story a little later as we go along. So um, I want to dispel the myth that ketones are just harmful byproducts of metabolism. And that has been written in medical textbooks for eons. And a lot of uh, doctors still believe that. They, they think of diabetic ketoacidosis, and we'll talk about that later too, what the difference is. But uh, there's been a lot of work going on since the 1990s, uh, beginning mainly in the lab of Dr. Richard Beach, studying ketones and what the therapeutic uh, possibilities are. So we're going to discuss where, you know, the history of that idea uh, and how that evolved. And um, specifically what conditions might benefit from uh, ketosis, which is increasing ketone levels um, into physiologic range, uh, not to the levels that you get with diabetic ketoacidosis. And we're also going to talk about uh, medium chain triglycerides and the role that, that they play 
and providing this alternative fuel to the brain, as well as um, other ketogenic strat strategies such as ketogenic diet, exogenous ketone supplements, which have just recently become available, fasting and exercise. So uh, ketones have been around as a fuel for as long as life has been on Earth, estimated about three and a half billion years ago. Uh, there were one cell organisms called archaea that still exist today that um, used ketones as one of its three fuels. And most bacteria today can use um, the ketone beta hydroxybutyrate as fuel. Uh, as far as humans go, the fetal brain is capable of using ketones as early as 20 weeks, possibly sooner. That's the earliest it's been looked at. And uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women are in ketosis naturally. Uh, women go into ketosis sooner than men, and uh, the younger a person is, an infant and a child go into ketosis uh, much quicker than an adult uh, during fasting or starvation. Uh, another interesting point is that the breastfed newborn, the baby who is strictly breastfed, not formula fed, will go into ketosis starting within hours of birth. So um, uh, going way back in history, um, Epilepsy was treated, uh, and there's documentation that it was treated by Hippocrates um, as a medical phenomenon, not a spiritual phenomenon. And he reported that fasting seemed to be the only effective treatment. And this was brought up again in the Bible. And uh, it was documented in the early 20th century uh, with the earliest um, written reports that are available on PubMed that fasting uh, was useful in the treatment of seizures, uh, you know, people with um, uh, multiple seizures, epilepsy. So in 1921, Roland Woodyatt discovered that either starvation or consuming a very high fat, very low carbohydrate diet resulted in the production of the ketone bodies, beta hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone in healthy people. So shortly after that report, uh, Russell Wilder of the Mayo Clinic uh, began to call this type of diet that resulted in high uh, levels of ketones a ketogenic diet. And they decided to test it for epilepsy since it was similar to, uh, you know, uh, to see if it would get similar results um, to uh, fasting to treat epilepsy. And in fact, they did find that they had patients that responded to a ketogenic diet by stopping their seizures, you know, within several days. And the ketogenic diet has been around now uh, for almost 100 years as a result. And it went on the back burner uh, when anticonvulsants came along because a lot of people responded to those. But it was studied and maintained as a therapy all along at Johns Hopkins Hospital and other hospitals um, during that time, but mainly Johns Hopkins, uh, who um, have studied it and uh, in recent years have um, uh, carried out quite a bit of research uh, showing the efficacy of it that about one in four uh, children with epilepsy uh, will completely stop having seizures on a ketogenic diet and another 50% will have a, a great reduction by half to 90% of the number of seizures that they have. So a very valuable um, an option uh, for children and now adults who don't respond to anticonvulsant medications. So in the 1950s, around 1959, Dr. Sammy Hashem and an industrial chemist, uh, Vegan Babion, um, decided to analyze coconut oil. There were um, techniques coming along that made it more uh, possible to analyze and also to separate the fatty acids in various fats. And they discovered that eight to 10% of the fats in coconut oil were the medium chain fatty acids, C8 and C10. And so they separated them from other fats in the coconut oil and noted that it brought along two other medium chain fatty acids, C6 and C12. Um, while for many years, these uh, MCTs were considered a waste product by many oil manufacturers, they decided to study them to find out what the properties were and uh, whether there might be any therapeutic uses for this particular class of fatty acids. So they found that MCT oil is easily absorbed. Uh, it doesn't require pancreatic enzymes to be uh, digested. Um, it is transported by way of the portal vein directly to the liver. 
And um, they also learned that it was beneficial when used in adults and children who had malabsorption syndromes and following bowel surgery. They also um, studied uh, premature newborns and found that it was very well tolerated and could help them gain weight more quickly if it was added to their feedings. So this led to the use of MCT oil in newborn intensive care units um, to um, add directly to the feedings of micro preemies. So these are babies weighing under two pounds. And uh, this happened to be when I was training and we would add uh, about one ml of MCT oil to each of the feedings of these extremely tiny babies. And, uh, it seemed to help them grow faster and get home sooner. And then in the 1980s, uh, the formula manufacturers developed premature infant formulas that include and still today include MCT oil and also coconut and palm kernel oils, which contain these medium chain triglycerides uh, from which um, MCT oil are usually extracted. And uh, one of the other important factors to what we're talking about today are that MCTs are ketogenic. Um, that uh, they are converted in the liver, uh, part of it is converted to ketones. So um, this was reported in 1966, and this just uh, shows um, when you ingest um, uh, MCT oil or coconut oil, that part of it is taken up by the liver and converted to ketones. And then uh, the brain can actually take up ketones very quickly and eagerly and use them as fuel. So this is some of the nomenclature associated with um, medium chain fatty acids. Uh, the easiest thing is to say C6, C8, C10, or C12. Um, each one of them seems to have very special properties and these are still being discovered uh, recently. Uh, for example, um, C6 is just uh, really being looked at more closely now. It, it uh, reportedly tastes very bad, but it's uh, highly ketogenic. Um, C8 is considered very ketogenic as well. Um, C10 is not as ketogenic, but it seems to stimulate um, uh, an increase in the number of mitochondria in cells. And it's also been found recently to have anticonvulsant effects. And C12, lauric acid, uh, part of it goes to the liver and part of it goes into the bloodstream like a longer chain fat. And um, it is uh, has been found to be antimicrobial and also uh, possibly ketogenic in astrocytes. This is in vitro, uh, needs to be proven in vivo and studies are going on. We'll talk about that more later. So in 1967, Dr. George Cahill, an MD who uh, did um, uh, an amazing uh, body of work on studying nutrition, found that ketones are an alternative fuel for the brain during starvation. And their first patient was a nurse who was a volunteer that wanted to lose weight. And they put her on a fast for 41 days uh, during which she got only water, vitamins, and salt tablets. And they sampled blood with catheters uh, that were placed in her arteries and veins around her brain and liver and tested many different metabolites. And they found that her brain survived this lengthy period of starvation by using ketones and by greatly reducing the use of glucose. So um, you can see on the um, screen here that beta hydroxybutyrate climbs over a period of time and somewhere you know, around three weeks it levels off. And as long as there's fat to burn, you will keep um, a sustained level of ketosis uh, during starvation. And uh, this is, uh, acetoacetate, uh, one of the other um, ketone bodies. And they confirmed the study, you know, with other patients. And another interesting study uh, they did that they probably could not get away with today were to, uh, was to starve uh, three obese college students who <laughs> were paid to do this. And um, they um, were starved until their beta hydroxybutyrate levels increased. And then they were given a bolus of insulin to drive their blood sugar way down into the hypoglycemic range. And normally you would expect somebody to have tremors, possibly seizures. There was even the potential to die during this experiment, but they found that um, these uh, students did not um, have any of the usual symptoms of hypoglycemia. So they were able to conclude that um, ketones were neuroprotective, that, you know, they provide this alternative fuel to the brain and protect it from symptoms uh, related to hypoglycemia in this case. So during an overnight fast, 
Um, normally, we will use 100% of our fuel as glucose, whereas during starvation, you can see glucose is just a, a, about a third of this. Whoops. And um, the uh, uh, acetoacetate and uh, beta hydroxybutyrate are two thirds. And then some glucose is derived from breaking down amino acids during starvation. So ketones are relatively small molecules. Uh, there are uh, three to four carbons in, uh, in, in chains. And uh, this just shows the comparison between the ketone body beta hydroxybutyrate and glucose. Uh, uh, the ketones are smaller molecules than glucose. And uh, there's a, some terms that have come into use recently called endogenous ketones versus exogenous ketones. So endogenous ketones are those that originate within the body. And during fasting and starvation or a keto type diet, a low carb diet, um, you turn, uh, we turn to burning uh, fat as fuel and the fat releases uh, fatty acids. Um, this also happens to be talked about if you consume MCT oil, the body will convert uh, part of this to ketones. And the ketones, um, uh, mainly uh, acetoacetate is made and it converts to acetone, which is mostly exhaled and accounts for the unusual breath that people have when they're in ketosis. Um, and a large portion of acetoacetate is converted to beta hydroxybutyrate, and that's the main circulating form in the bloodstream. So during starvation, uh, this just illustrates that fatty acids can be used by most of the other organs, the heart, the muscles, the liver, um, but they are not taken up well by the brain. So they don't serve as a great fuel for the brain during starvation. And um, the brain is a highly active organ. It's only about 2% of our body weight, but uses about 20 to 25% of the calories we consume. So during fasting or starvation, the brain needs a source of fuel. So ketones can also be used by the muscle in the heart um, and are not used by the liver uh, where ketones are made, uh, but are taken up very quickly by the brain. And um, the brain has what we call metabolic flexibility because it can instantaneously switch from using glucose to ketones uh, for energy. So back to history, um, in 1976, um, Dr. Huttenwalker from Yale University uh, had the idea to make the classic ketogenic diet more palatable, uh, allowing more protein and carb carbohydrates in the diet by adding MCT oil since it is ketogenic. And um, they found that they were able to reduce from using about 90% fat in this diet to 60% of um, the calories as fat and specifically as medium chain triglycerides and that this was effective in uh, treating children with epilepsy and reducing or eliminating their seizures. So um, getting to Alzheimer's, so around 1971, <laughs> move that a second, 1970, Dr. Siegfried Hoyer um, was looking at the brains of people with dementia and he found that certain people with uh, dementia had decreased glucose levels and a lower cerebral metabolic rate in the brain. And he continued to study this and he reported uh, in um, the 1990s that young normal people use glucose in a ratio of 100 to 1 of uh, alternative fuels um, in the brain. Elderly people without Alzheimer's um, had a reduction in this ratio to 29 uh, to one, a ratio of glucose to alternative fuels. But in the early stages of Alzheimer's, this ratio was only two to one, um, the, it's suggesting that uh, the Alzheimer brain needs alternative fuels uh, that potentially it's not getting. And he suggested that fuel for the brain must come from um, fatty acids and amino acids, but he didn't mention ketones at this point. So um, in the 1980s, there were techniques developed using MRI and PET scans um, uh, over this period of time and showing that there was, uh, they were able to document that there was in fact decreased glucose uptake 
in the Alzheimer brain. And uh, these are some of the first two studies, and there were many, many more studies since then. Um, also, around 1981, a group at Karolinska Institute uh, used a technique called arteriovenous difference, and they were able to show that in Alzheimer's, uh, glucose uptake was decreased, but ketone uptake was actually normal um, in people that had pre-senile dementia, which is now called early onset Alzheimer's, you know, compared to normal healthy adults. Um, so one of the questions that has been around for a long time with Alzheimer's is this problem of glucose uptake in the brain. Is it a result of um, just the absence of neurons because the neurons have died? Or is it a lack of fuel? Is it simply a lack of uh, fuel um, that neurons are not able to take up uh, glucose as a result of insulin resistance? Uh, so their study suggested that neurons might be dormant and not all dead. In 1989, uh, Dr. Russell Swerdlow was a medical student at the time, and he had learned in his biochemistry 101 class that uh, ketones become increased during starvation. And he happened to be working in a research lab where they were studying Alzheimer's, and uh, they were had uh, they were studying hippocampal um, homogenates. So these were directly from the brains of people with um, Alzheimer's, and they um, had confirmed. Uh, as the imaging studies were confirming that there was decreased glucose uptake into the hippocampus of people with Alzheimer's. And he did a study and found that, again, using a completely different technique than the group from Sweden, that there was normal ketone uptake in the Alzheimer's brain. And he got funding to do a ketogenic diet study in Alzheimer's, but he graduated from medical school. He moved on to somewhere else to finish his residency. And this study was dropped uh, by the people he left behind. So unfortunately, uh, we could have learned this many years sooner, but we didn't. Um, so along come the 1990s and Dr. Richard Veach, uh, who's an MD and a PhD who um, studied at Oxford um, in the lab of Hans Krebs, who developed the Krebs cycle or TCA cycle, uh, he became interested in ketones and what they do and whether there might be any therapeutic value to um, using ketones. And one of his landmark studies was reported in 2000. And what they did was they grew um, neurons from the areas of the brain related to Alzheimer's and to Parkinson's. And they added a toxin to these cultures known to cause um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So these were separate cultures. And to some of the cultures, they added the ketone beta hydroxybutyrate at the levels that you would see during starvation. And the um, other cultures served as controls. And the very significant findings of their study were that um, there was increased survival of the neurons who received uh, the ketone uh, treatment compared to the controls. And they also found that the size of the neurons was larger and there was a greater outgrowth of neurites suggesting that ketones can act as growth factors to neurons and culture. So at that point, he began developing a uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate ketone ester um, to study it further as a possible uh, therapy for Alzheimer's and other diseases. So this is Dr. Richard Beach, and um, as a result of that 2000 study, he and Dr. George Cahill, who had uh, discovered that ketones increased during starvation, and uh, Dr. Theodore Van Italy, who was one of the doctors that uh, discovered that MCTs are ketogenic, they began to write hypothesis papers about this. So this was around 2001 to 2004. And um, this uh, just is a schematic showing basically the idea, you know, here is um, a cell membrane and there's insulin resistance and Alzheimer's disease and so glucose uh, may not be able to enter this particular cell. And then, uh, but uh, ketones don't require insulin to get in. They use monocarboxylate transporters. And um, the, uh, when glucose is blocked, uh, the ketones can be uh, taken up very quickly into the mitochondria and enter the TCH cycle to produce ATP. And this is just a very simple schematic here up in the corner. 
showing uh, that they both enter the same biochemical pathway to, to produce ATP. So um, here's this chart of metabolism that many of you have uh, no doubt seen. And I mean, literally hundreds, maybe thousands of chemical reactions involved in our metabolic processes. And, um, you know, on the chart, here's the TCA cycle. And you can see there are many more steps from uh, getting glucose into the TCA cycle than, uh, than ketones require. So it's actually easier for ketones to get into the TCA cycle. Um, but ketones also have uh, very many other uh, metabolic pathways that they enter. And some of those involve um, mimicking the effects of insulin when blood sugar is low, um, stimulating lipolysis, uh, um, stimulating anti-inflammatory mechanisms, uh, reducing appetite uh, by, by way of affecting uh, hormones that uh, make us satisfied, uh, reducing free oxygen free radicals. Um, they act as scavengers of reactive oxygen species and um, there are studies showing that uh, just the even low levels of ketosis in the blood increases cerebral blood flow by about 39%. And in the lower corner here, um, uh, Dr. Beach very recently in 2019 published a paper um, showing what chemical, you know, what happens um, that many of these effects can be attributed to. And I will let you read that. <laughs> So um, these are just some of the diseases that could be affected uh, therapeutically by providing ketones, um, thinking of them as alternative fuel to the brain, but also uh, nearly all of these diseases involve inflammation as well, which contributes to the pathology of the disease and the pro progression of the disease. So it's Alzheimer's and many other um, neurodegenerative diseases, um, as well as epilepsy and type 2 diabetes, diabetes and pre-diabetes, um, and even type 1 diabetes could potentially uh, benefit from treatment with uh, ketones. That's a huge number of people in this country. If you get to be 75, you have a three, uh, uh, at 75 years old, you have a 75% chance that you'll have either diabetes or pre-diabetes if you live in the U.S., and it's even worse in many other countries. So um, ketones are anti-inflammatory, and here are other diseases um, that are um, characterized by inflammation, uh, highly contributing to the um, disease. And so uh, providing ketones as a therapy uh, could potentially be beneficial. And it's like, well, how, how can ketones provide so many effects for so many different diseases? And I think it's, it's just because it's such a fundamental, basic, primitive fuel, glucose and ketones are the, the two primary fuels that we can use. And, um, you know, ketones have so many uh, effects in the metabolic pathway. So um, Dr. Beach published his study in 2000, the landmark study that um, ketones are neuroprotective. And Dr. Samuel Henderson uh, is a PhD. Uh, his mother died from Alzheimer's disease. And he had the idea that possibly generating ketones by consuming MCT oil could improve people with Alzheimer's disease. And he filed a patent for a medical food uh, that was MCT oil to treat Alzheimer's and um, uh, performed a pilot study and um, a, a longer study with about 152 people in which they were able to show that nearly half of these people with Alzheimer's responded with um, improved cognition and memory um, within 90 minutes or so of taking MCT oil. Very interesting study. And Dr. Van Italy, who um, was involved with the MCT discovering that it was ketogenic, um, did a study for Parkinson's disease. And this was um, five people completed the study and uh, they used what they called a hyperketogenic diet for 28 days. And this one did not contain MCT oil, um, but it did raise ketone levels quite high, six to seven millimoles. And they found that there was a very substantial improvement in the Parkinson's symptoms in, in these people that were on the ketogenic diet. So now we come to 2008, and this is where um, our story 
takes place. And um, at that point, you know, that's my husband, Steve, and he had his first symptoms when he was only 51 years old, uh, around 2001. Um, he started having problems with memory, um, making big payroll mistakes, uh, procrastinating, not getting quarterly reports for taxes done, which should have taken 20 minutes. And, and then he started forgetting if he'd been to the bank and the post office. And that was clearly not normal. And he, at age 54, was officially diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And by May 2008, he was 58 years old and he could no longer drive for a couple of years at that point. He, had, he was unable to read due to a visual disturbance for about a year and a half. He couldn't even, he was a, a, somebody who used a computer all day. He loved computers. He always had to have the fastest. And he, um, he um, couldn't even remember how to turn it on or use a calculator or do simple math. And um, he had trouble completing sentences and finding words and didn't recognize relatives. And he had developed a very slow, weird gait. He couldn't pick up his feet and run. He had tremors. He would take things apart, like instead of mowing the grass, he would take the tractor apart um, and those kind of problems. He was very depressed and he was very well aware that he had Alzheimer's and he knew what he had been able to do and what he could no longer do. It was a, just a horrible time for him. And um, so there were two clinical trials that became available in our area uh, at the same time. There hadn't been any for several years. And I... Um, was able to arrange for him to have screenings for these clinical trials two days in a row. And the night before I was online um, and looking for the risks and benefits of these two drugs and happened on a press release about the medical food that Dr. Samuel Henderson was working on and that had improved the memory and cognition in nearly half of Alzheimer's patients. And the press release didn't really say what it was or what it did. So I was able to find a patent application and this is where I learned that Alzheimer's is a type of diabetes of the brain. So uh, for many years, uh, the big focus on Alzheimer's has been on plaques and tangles. Uh, drug development has been aimed at reducing the plaques uh, with the belief that this would uh, make people with Alzheimer's better. And um, there have been hundreds of millions of dollars spent on this, probably billions of dollars and there are no drugs for Alzheimer's that improve cognition or memory, and there are only um, a few drugs that may slow down the course of the disease for six months. Um, some of the biggest drug companies have, comp have decided to get out of the Alzheimer drug business because um, they've tr tested drug after drug after drug, and none of them have been helpful. So, um, but in the background, there was research going on that had been ignored until very recently, um, looking at this problem of glucose getting into the Alzheimer's brain. And there was really an explosion of research. It just uh, wasn't getting to the forefront. And one group that I focus on is Dr. Suzanne Delamonte um, at Brown University. And they looked at the brains of people with advanced Alzheimer's who did not have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Uh, these were people that died with Alzheimer's. And they found that the levels of insulin and factors related to making and using insulin were greatly reduced. All of the signaling pathways involved in the use of energy are abnormal. The functioning of mitochondria is abnormal. And they coined the term type 3 diabetes to describe the insulin deficiency and insulin resistance that occurs in the Alzheimer brain. <clears throat> then they looked um, at brains of people who had died at various stages of the disease. And they found that this started in particular areas of the brain and that it spread throughout the brain and until it was uh, literally throughout the brain and very severe in uh, people in the last stages of Alzheimer's. <clears throat> so in addition to the insulin resistance and insulin deficiency that they found, there's also a problem with um, uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex deficiency. And that's one of the early steps of getting glucose into the Krebs cycle. Um, also, the GLUT1 and GLUT3 transporters that transport glucose into the brain and into neurons are deficient in Alzheimer's. So it's almost like there's a conspiracy of getting glucose into the brain. And these are some uh, uh, PET scans showing um, on the uh, left a normal brain, and the yellow and red areas are areas of high glucose uptake, and blue are low uh, glucose uptake. And you can see on the Alzheimer's brain, that there's a lot of blue, um, a lot of areas where there is very poor glucose uptake. 
And uh, one group has looked as far back as people in their 20s who were at risk by virtue of their family history and have found that there is abnormal glucose uptake already present in people in their 20s um, who are at risk for Alzheimer's, a frightening prospect. So then, you know, you start thinking prevention, what can we do to prevent this? So um, the question for Steve was, would ketones um, bypass this fundamental problem of getting glucose into the brain by providing ketones from an, from, as an alternative fuel in Alzheimer's disease? So we go back, um, here's the schematic where uh, MCT oil and or coconut oil are uh, taken up in the liver and converted partly to ketones and the ketones can be used by the brain. A brilliant idea. And um, I was familiar with MCT oil because we used it in the uh, newborn intensive care unit when I was in training. And it turns out human breast milk is about 10 to 17% medium chain triglycerides of the fats. Uh, it's 10 to 17% of the fats. Um, and as I said, we um, added it to the formulas of our uh, preemies and then they became standard in, in premature infant formulas. So, um, uh, MCT oil usually comes from coconut and or palm kernel oil. And they, MCTs are not found in any of the usual fats that we eat here in the USA. Um, corn oil, soybean oil, olive oil, even fish oil have no medium chain triglycerides. But they are found. Uh, coconut oil is the richest natural source. Palm kernel oil is a close second, um, but also found in the milk fat of uh, not only humans, but other mammals as well. Um, goat milk, for example, has a little bit more, higher percentage of medium chain triglycerides than human breast milk. So you'll find them in heavy cream and in cheeses that come from uh, dairy and goat milk. So back to Steve, <clears throat> we're at May 20th of 2008, and I had learned about um, uh, this medical food that was going to, was still a year away from becoming available that was MCT oil, but I didn't have any time to go out and do anything about it. Uh, this was about 1 a.m. in the morning and he was scheduled to screen at 9 a.m. And we went for the screening and he needed to score at least 16 points on a mini mental status exam, which is a memory test that's very easy. If you're normal, you should get 30 points. And he scored only 14. And the doctor had him draw a clock, which is a test for Alzheimer's. And you can see it's not organized at all. It's very disorganized, a few little circles, a few numbers. And she told me that he was on the verge of um, severe Alzheimer's disease. So um, thinking, what do we have to lose? <laughs> and having read that MCT oil comes from coconut oil, is extracted from coconut oil, I picked some up on the way home. And when, I, when we got home, I got on the internet, uh, remind myself, what are the medium chain triglycerides? And uh, from the USDA website, I was able to get the fatty acid composition of coconut oil. And as you can see, um, the C6 through C12, the MCTs, add up to almost 60% of the fats in coconut oil. And so I estimated to equal the 20 gram dose they were using in the medical food trial um, that I should give him 35 grams of coconut oil. Um, now, what I, I, I didn't really know too much about it at this point, but uh, the 20 grams was all C8. They were going for the most ketogenic uh, MCT, and I was factoring all of the uh, medium chain triglycerides into this equation. But nonetheless, the next day, um, I gave him 35 grams of coconut oil. He was scheduled several hours later to be tested for the second clinical trial. And this was in a different location, a different city, different facility different day, and he gained four points on the test. He knew what city he was in, what floor he was on, the day of the week, and uh, the season, uh, which are questions he had not gotten the day before, and this time he qualified for the study. So we were elated, and um, I, at first I didn't know if we had just gotten very lucky or if he, the coconut oil had something to do with it. So, but we kept it going, and the next day I started uh, looking at cookbooks, and I started every day giving him a measured dose of coconut oil of at least 35 grams, but then we started cooking with it throughout the rest of the day, and <clears throat> many things happened that first couple of weeks, but uh, one of the uh, visually very obvious things that happened was this. Um, so this is the day before he started coconut oil, his clock, 
and this is 14 days later. And as you can see, this is much more complex. He's got the full circle, all the numbers are there. There's a, at least one number repeated in there. Um, but, uh, and a million hands of the clock, <laughs> but it's so much more complex and more organized than the one from the day before. And then this one is at 37 days after starting coconut oil. It's actually looking a little bit cleaner and tidier. And these are the clocks side by side. And some of the other things that happened were, um, you know, people with Alzheimer's often have kind of a dead look on their, his, in their face, but he developed more animation in his face, his personality and sense of humor returned. He started whistling these medleys that he used to whistle. He recognized family members that he hadn't recognized for a while. His tremors, um, his facial tremor completely resolved. Um, his tremor when he was eating uh, would be there a little bit in the morning until he had his coconut oil and after 20 or 30 minutes it would go away. Over about two months his gait normalized and he could run again. He had a visual disturbance um, that he said it was like the, the words would shake on the page and that's why he couldn't read and that stopped after about three or four months. And he resumed yard and housework and yeah. Um, he was able to initiate uh, and make conversation that made sense. And another uh, really important thing to him was that um, after about seven or eight months, he was doing so well that he was able to volunteer uh, at the hospital where I worked. He worked in the warehouse um, helping to deliver supplies and putting stickers on supplies and things like that that made him feel useful again and made him very happy. So, um, at first we were using just coconut oil and he had a dramatic re improvement just with that. And then um, Dr. Veach from the NIH uh, was in contact with him quite a lot. And he said, let's measure his levels uh, with coconut oil and then with MCT oil. And we found that coconut oil, um, the levels of ketones peaked at about three hours and they weren't really very high. Although the second dose after dinner, they went up quite a bit higher, uh, the beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate levels. Um, with MCT oil, we, we tested that a couple weeks later and found that his peak level was higher, but the ketones were completely back to baseline three hours after taking the dose. So I um, rationalized that, you know, um, to take 20 grams once a day and have the ketone levels gone in for three hours, you know, what do you do? What does your brain do for the other 21 hours? And so um, I started uh, mixing coconut and MCT oil to try to create a smooth, constant uh, level of ketones for him and gradually increased how much we were giving him so that he was getting it uh, three times a day and then eventually four times a day. And uh, he ended up getting quite a lot. Uh, we were probably at nine or 10 to 11 tablespoons a day after uh, four months or so. Um, and he naturally started eliminating fruit and uh, pasta and bread and things like that from his diet. So effectively it put him on a ketogenic diet. Um, and uh, he tested again uh, uh, about two months um, after we started the coconut oil for clinical trial. And this time his mini mental status test was up to 20 points. Um, he qualified for the study. We told them what we were doing and they didn't think food would have any impact on their study. So they allowed him to enter the study. And so he had a lot of testing the first year and we learned later that he was on the placebo for at least 12 to 14 months. And he had um, a, a significant improvement on the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale during that time and activities of daily living. He gained, improved by 14 out of 78 points, which is very significant. This is your day-to-day -day functioning, how, how well you can do things for yourself. And um, Steve's case study was published in 2015, um, and this was about um, and his improvement with medium chain triglycerides between 2008 and 2010. And then um, in 2010, um, he became a, uh, the only uh, subject of a clinical study of one with the beta hydroxybutyrate ketone ester that Dr. Veach was developing, um, and it stabilized him for another 20 months at that point. Um, and we'll talk about that a little later in more detail. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, just for a second. Almost spilled a glass of water all over everything. Um, so I became, when Steve improved so much, I thought, 
If he improves, other people would improve too, and why should they have to wait another year for a medical food when coconut oil and MCT oil are actually on the shelf already? <coughs> so I um, devoted a lot of time uh, to getting the message out to other people. And I, first I wrote an article, and then I wrote uh, a couple of books, and um, the um, our story got picked up in the Tampa Bay Times, and it went viral. So I started hearing back from other people and started collecting little case reports. And in 2012, I had 184 little case reports of people um, with dementia, dementia and other memory impairment, most of whom had improved. And I don't consider a scientific study. I was really just trying to get an idea of um, what kind of improvements they were reporting. And it was very similar to what we were seeing with, um, with Steve. And those are some of the verbatim um, phrases that they use in their emails uh, that I kind of use to try to categorize what kind of improvements they were seeing. And so some of the other people that have responded uh, that um, here are clocks um, from this is an engineer in Taiwan before MCTs. And you can see he has a lot of extra numbers in his clock. But after taking MCTs, he has a much more normal looking clock on the bottom here. And this is another lady from a care home in Taiwan, and her clock is very confused before taking MCTs and becomes much more normal, although she has 13 numbers in her clock, but it's a lot better than that. And um, there have been a number of studies now, and um, one that I want to mention is um, from a, a group carried out by a group in Japan, and they looked at a, an assisted living facility that had 38 frail elderly patients. <clears throat> And a third of them continued their, their usual diet. A third of them got a food that contained six grams of MCT oil plus 1.2 grams of leucine and vitamin D. And, and the other third got the same supplement, but with a long chain fat, I believe it was sunflower oil uh, instead of MCT oil. And they studied cognitive changes after three months, and they found that the group that received the MCT oil had significant improvements and their cognitive testing, uh, very substantial on the um, this uh, Nishimura geriatric rating scale, 30% uh, improvement. And uh, whereas all the people that were on the regular diet and the group taking the long chain uh, fats as in the supplement had worse cognition after three months. They also uh, reported in a separate um, article um, <clears throat> the same group and uh, looking at physical parameters and they found that they had actually um, significantly better muscle strength in the group that received MCT oil. So um, Dr. Russell Swerdlow, who was our medical student back in 1989 that found that ketones are uptake as normal, um, came back to this eventually and did a study recently with ketogenic diet, a pilot study. Um, using MCT oil, and they did find that there was cognitive improvement um, after people uh, were taking MCT oil for three months. <clears throat> then they took them off of it, and after a one-month washout period, they were back to their baselines. Um, I am uh, very proud to um, say that in 2017, although it was many years later, <laughs> that um, the first ever session uh, was presented at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference and was organized by Dr. Stephen Kunane of um, Canada to discuss uh, the role of ketones as an alternative fuel for the brain for and as an intervention for Alzheimer's disease. And Dr. Kunane has done amazing work, amazing work, um, and <clears throat> he talks about the push and pull of brain fuel uptake. So basically, he says that glucose is pulled into the brain depending on what the metabolic needs of the brain are. Ketones are pushed into the brain based on what the actual um, blood level of ketones are. So the higher the blood level, the more ketones are pushed into the brain. And Alzheimer's disease, there's a problem with this uh, mismatch of how much energy the brain needs and how much is provided by glucose because of the blockade and getting glucose into neurons. <clears throat> Whereas um, ketones, if available, could potentially provide fuel to the brain. 
So um, this is just a beautiful uh, picture from some of the work they've been doing, and they are using <clears throat> ketone and glucose PET scans. They do them back to back when they're studying uh, people. They had studied uh, young adults, uh, normal, healthy, older adults, uh, people with mild cognitive impairment that can lead to Alzheimer's and people with Alzheimer's disease. And you can see in the upper part of the screen, <clears throat> this is the ketone PET scan. Before a ketogenic diet, we're seeing blue, which means that there's virtually no uptake of uh, ketones there. <coughs> They're just simply not in the blood and not available. Whereas after the ketogenic diet, the brain is lit up red and yellow, <clears throat> showing uptake of ketones into the brain. And here um, is the glucose PET scan. And you can see before the ketogenic diet, red areas, high intensity uptake of um, the ketones. And after the ketogenic diet, this diminishes, but ketones are being taken up. And um, he says that this basically indicates that if the brain has a choice between glucose and ketones, it will use ketones as available. Uh, very interesting finding. <clears throat> He's also pieced together a number of studies to show that there's a linear relationship between plasma ketones and um, <clears throat> acetoacetate brain uptake on these ketone PET scans. Um, he's also been able to show that and confirm, again, that glucose uptake is, is abnormal in Alzheimer's, uh, but ketone uptake is normal. So this is a third method showing that ketone uptake is normal throughout the areas of the brain affected by Alzheimer's. And this supports the idea of using ketones as an alternative fuel. <clears throat> And he, um, one of the things they've discovered is that even cognitively normal older adults have about a 7% gap between how much fuel, how much fuel the brain needs and how much it gets, how much energy the brain needs and how much energy it gets. And they have um, been doing studies with MCT oil and they've been able to show that using MCT oil can increase the amount of ketone provided to the brain and help close this gap. <clears throat> And they just finished um, a, uh, it's called the Benefic trial, um, MCT oil given for six months to people with mild cognitive impairment. And they were using 30 grams a day and they found that it did, uh, that they did, the people did improve on their cognitive testing and um, they and had increased ketone uptake in the brain when taking MCT oil. <clears throat> and they predict that 45 grams may be even more beneficial. And now um, this study benefit was uh, funded by the Alzheimer's Association, and now they are going to fund the first ever um, study of the ketone ester uh, in people with mild cognitive impairment to see if it can help prevent Alzheimer's disease. So this is um, a collection of just some of the MCT oil studies that have taken place now for mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's. And I wanna show you a little video um, this is Bill Curtis. He has um, Parkinson's disease. And um, this is, he's playing the guitar in this video. And uh, you'll see that <clears throat> he starts having a tremor. He goes away. He takes coffee with coconut oil. <coughs> and uh, you'll see what happens. <laughs> So you see he's starting to tremor, <clears throat> which is one of the more common symptoms in Parkinson's disease. And he can't finish the song. <clears throat> so he puts his guitar down. Yeah. And he comes back. <clears throat> this is about an hour or so after he took the uh, coconut oil with his coffee. So um, 
back to Steve and part two. Uh, this is with the ketone ester. So <clears throat> he was in uh, the clinical trial. He was on the placebo for about 12 to 14 months. And then he was on the medication <clears throat> called semigasostat that was supposed to help prevent accumulation of plaque in the brain. And he um, was on that probably for five to seven months. <clears throat> and then he started having uh, side effects from it. Poor wound healing. He fainted. His CPK went way up. We weren't sure if it was from heart or muscle, <clears throat> but we decided to pull him out of the study. And he also had a big setback. He was um, deteriorating and doing some new things that he had not been doing before. And uh, so Dr. Veach <clears throat> was only able to make enough for one person in his lab of the ketone ester and provided this to Steve. And um, this is a, a ester that's a combination of beta hydroxybutyrate and butane diol. <clears throat> and when the molecule breaks apart after digestion, the butane diol is converted to more beta hydroxybutyrate. So a really pretty nifty idea. And so um, uh, we began to give, give Steve a 25% solution of the ester um, divided into three doses a day. <clears throat> and we found that there was actually immediate improvement in his mood and he was able to write out the whole alphabet, which he had not been able to do. This is just during the first couple of hours. Within 24 hours, he was back to being able to choose his own clothes and dress himself, bathe himself, um, take a shower, uh, shave, you know, without um, needing prompting for every step along the way, <clears throat> which I had to do the day before. And he continued to improve over about six to eight weeks and got back to doing the activities that um, he had been doing uh, before he had the setback. <clears throat> so um, we uh, experimented with different levels of doses and you can see that, for example, a 50 gram dose got his levels as high as seven millimoles, which is actually quite high. And so we, we ended up settling around uh, 25 grams three times a day for most of the time that he was taking this. And it actually stabilized him, it was very stable for another 20 months before he had his next, next setback, taking the ketone ester. And we did continue the coconut and MCT oil during this time. Um, as his wife and caregiver, I was reluctant to give up something that he had responded so well to. <clears throat> so now we're back to, um, this is Bill Curtis again, and this is, um, a uh, day that he did not take a ketone ester versus a day that he did. Two hours and 15 minutes since I did my next medication with my medication director today. And this is normally when I start to develop off symptoms. So I thought I would. You can see he's got a tremor going. Today. I haven't taken them from BHB. BHB is beta-hydroxybutyrate, <clears throat> the ketone body. So this is uh, a different it's day. Friday, right? July 31st, mm -hmm. and I uh, my meds about uh, 5, 5 5.15, 3 hours, 15 minutes ago, and I should be off by now, but I've been uh, driving my beta hydroxybutyrate levels up, so I took something that drove them up. He took the uh, ketone ester, Dr. Beach's ketone ester. I just wanted to do a few things so you can see. You can see you're not seeing the tremor. It's really quite remarkable. And, um, you know, other people with um, Parkinson's have been using MCT and coconut oil and ketogenic diets, um, exogenous ketone supplements, ketone salts, and finding. Uh, 
similar results with this reporting that. So I, I know of a couple of studies that are about to take place um, in Parkinson's disease as well. Yeah, quite interesting. <laughs> So um, uh, back to the ketogenic diet, uh, as we talked about earlier, the classic ketogenic diet is very high in fat. We're talking 80 to 90 percent fat and very low in carbohydrate, <clears throat> usually around 5 percent. But um, there's kind of really a wide spectrum on what could be considered ketogenic. Um, the more fat you eat, the more grams you have in the diet and the lower the amount of carbohydrate and uh, protein in the diet uh, combined. Uh, the more likely you will be in ketosis. Um, protein is important. Um, it needs to be controlled because if you eat too much protein, part of it will be converted to glucose. So if you're trying to be ketogenic, that's not a good thing. So um, ideally, you would eat the amount of protein you need to maintain lean body mass, which is about a half a gram per pound per day that you weigh. Uh, double that if you're somebody that's very physically active or bodybuilder or somebody like that. And um, it just gets an idea of, um, you know, what happens, you know, uh, what you need to take. And um, this comes from the Charlie Foundation. Um, this is a foundation that um, uh, was founded in the 1920, uh, 1990s by uh, Jim Abrams. Um, his son, Charlie, at 20 months, had a remarkable response to the ketogenic diet, completely quit having seizures, and he was having up to 100 seizures a day. He went to Johns Hopkins, um, and this happened after three or four days, completely stopped having seizures, and his, he was on the diet for about seven years and was able to go off of it, and now he is in his 20s, and he's teaching um, um, early development um, children, young children. And um, this chart is from their website, and it shows multiple uh, different options for the ketogenic diet. There's the most, the classic form, but um, research recently is showing that there are less strict forms of the diet that are also beneficial to many children and adults that have um, um, epilepsy. And they're also uh, broadening now and helping people with cancer and um, other conditions. So this shows some of the other strategies that can increase ketones besides diet. Um, caffeine can uh, bump ke uh, ketone levels up. Vigorous exercise will increase ketones and they'll stay elevated for um, eight or nine hours afterwards. An overnight fast after 10 to 14 hours, our liver becomes depleted of glucose and we will start breaking down fat and um, develop some mild ketosis. Um, there is a level that you can expect with MCT oil. Um, the more you take in a day, the higher that level could be. Uh, branch chain amino acids are ketogenic. Um, and now there are um, ketone supplements out on the market uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit. And the ketone ester, of course, which is also available on the market, um, that can, these can, um, ketone salts will, can get, get you a temporary bump, you know, up to maybe a moderate level if you combine that with a ketogenic diet or an overnight fast. Um, ketone ester can instantly get up to the levels in starvation. We're talking in 30 to 60 minutes, whereas it would take possibly weeks to get to that if you're um, starving or on a, um, a classic ketogenic diet. And um, here um, is, are the levels that you see with diabetic ketoacidosis, very high. And this occurs in people, usually people who are type one diabetics, where there's no insulin and there's an extremely high blood level of glucose. So it's a very abnormal pathologic state to start with. And fat starts breaking down rapidly and produces ketones too fast for the body to be able to buffer that and to compensate for that. So um, this other little chart here shows the range of physiologic ketosis. So um, mild nutritional ketosis is, is basically in the range of 0.5 to 1 millimoles, moderate perhaps 1 to 3 millimoles, um, deeper ketosis uh, where the people who have epilepsy, um, people who have cancer that want to try to control the cancer uh, may want to aim for these uh, higher levels of ketones with a stricter ketogenic diet. Um, so the ketone supplements, exogenous, they're called exogenous ketone supplements because they originate from outside of the body. So 
Uh, the ketone salts are the first um, available on the market that actually contain the ketone beta hydroxybutyrate. These became available in 2016. They were developed at the University of South Florida by um, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino and his associates. And basically it's the ketone beta hydroxybutyrate combined with sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And uh, they have experimented and kind of refined the ratio of these. Um, it's a powder that can be mixed in water. Um, one serving will usually yield eight to 10 grams of beta hydroxybutyrate and increase the ketone level with very quickly within uh, less than an hour to by 0.5 to one millimole from the baseline. So <clears throat> with the ketone salts, you know, um, they're out there, they're available. There are many companies that are um, selling them now, but I caution people that if, if you're planning to use this for an infant, a child, an elderly person, anybody with medical conditions, um, that a doctor really should be consulted. Um, there are um, some problems that can occur, uh, lowering of blood sugar and insulin levels, which may be great uh, for a normal healthy person, but for somebody with diabetes on medication, I, I think it's very valuable for people with diabetes, but they need to know that they need to monitor their blood sugar closely and they may have to reduce their insulin and other medications fairly quickly and they should do this monitored by their doctor. And also um, these supplements are, I don't recommend for uh, women who are pregnant or breastfeeding because they're naturally in ketosis and there are some case reports of women getting into trouble uh, with ketoacidosis. Um, with, they're on a strict uh, ketogenic diet uh, while pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, and the, uh, these supplements haven't been tested at all in pregnant or breastfeeding women. Not a good idea. <clears throat> so the um, beta hydroxybutyrate ester is also available. It's just been on the market for about a year now, available to the public. Um, it is very expensive. It tastes like jet fuel, although uh, the companies uh, making this are working on the taste and they've done a remarkable job of getting it to taste much better than when my husband was taking it. Um, it is uh, recognized by the FDA for use in um, healthy individuals for up to five days and specifically for athletic performance. Um, and wider, you know, broader toxicity studies are underway. Um, so uh, hopefully soon it will be approved for general use. And just need to be aware that a 20 to 35 gram dose can increase the levels from zero to five millimoles or higher in 30 to 60 minutes. And like the ketone salts, they do, uh, ketone esters do lower the blood glucose and insulin levels rather quickly and significantly. And um, um, also there are changes in electrolytes that can occur. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, if there's any kind of medical condition, um, age, uh, related factors that uh, that your doctor should be involved in monitoring closely. <clears throat> and these are just showing uh, there's a breath analyzer that can be used to kind of guesstimate uh, what ketone levels are. Um, the Probably the best way is to use a, 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 a ketone monitor, uh, which is very similar to a glucose monitor and showing them side by side. Um, I check my levels uh, fairly often as I'm always experimenting with different uh, ketogenic strategies. And um, so I check my blood sugar and my beta hydroxybutyrate and you can get a value um, within a matter of uh, seconds. <clears throat> so there are a couple other reasons why coconut oil, getting back to coconut oil, could have helped my husband. And we, we alluded to this earlier, lauric acid has been found by a group in Japan to potently stimulate and directly stimulate ketone production in astrocytes, and these are astrocytes in cultures. Um, astrocytes are brain cells that nourish other brain cells as part of their function. And um, uh, this is an in vitro study. So there are in vivo studies in progress that hopefully will get the results soon to confirm whether this actually occurs in living beings. But it could explain why with relatively low ketone levels, how my husband could have improved so much and why this uh, improvement continued um, over a year. Um, the other thing about lauric acid is that it's antimicrobial. Uh, there are hundreds of studies showing that um, lauric acid or C12 and to some degree C10 have effects against um, a, any number of bacteria, viruses, fungus, and protozoa um, by a number of different mechanisms. 
And this is, uh, well, lauric acid is prominent in human breast milk. And it was when I was uh, doing my neonatology training, I was told lauric acid is one of the factors in human breast milk that helps protect the newborn from infection. Um, it's used widely in the veterinary industry, animal industry, uh, to treat infections and um, uh, a derivative of lauric acid, monolaurin, um, is used as a uh, microbicide or microbiostatic agent for foods and non-food applications, uh, many different types of applications. And this is relevant to Alzheimer's disease um, because there is growing evidence that Alzheimer's may be caused, at least in some cases, by certain types of infections. Um, this is an article that was put out by a, a large number of researchers that have been studying this. And again, um, it's been ignored uh, by the Alzheimer's Association and <clears throat> the people that control funding. Um, but uh, these are some of the uh, possible infections that have been implicated as contributing to or possibly causing Alzheimer's disease. And the interesting thing is that lauric acid kills most of these um, microorganisms. So it could potentially be used as therapeutic above and beyond its um, ketogenic effect. Um, and then Dr. Ralph Martins, a, a longtime Alzheimer's researcher in Australia, decided to look at coconut oil and what possible other benefits it might have. And, um, so these are a couple here, and I know we're getting really late on time. <laughs> so um, one of the big problems with MCT and coconut oil is some people are very sensitive to it, and if they eat as much as my husband did, two tablespoons the first time they try it, they will end up with massive diarrhea. <laughs> so to avoid that, I caution people to start with a small amount, like one half to one teaspoon, two or three times a day with food, and increase it every few days if there's no problem you know, to the point that the person tolerates it, um, usually several tablespoons a day or, or more if the person can tolerate it eventually. Um, and in 2008, there was only one little uh, bottle of um, coconut oil on my shelf. And in 2019, there are a whole bunch of choices of different brands of coconut oil, which is very gratifying for me because I've been trying to get this message out all this time. And um, it's, it's really great to see that other people are becoming aware of it. And um, I have a new book coming out. Uh, there's a whole lot more information. This book's almost 500 pages long. Um, I interviewed 16 of the pioneers and rising stars of ketone uh, research um, patients, uh, dietitians who are doing ketogenic diet and, you know, basically put together, you know, um, everything I could uh, put together about ketones, uh, what ketones are, how they work. Uh, there are over 200 references that I used um, to, uh, and then the very practical nuts and bolts, how to actually go about um, planning a ketogenic diet for yourself. Um, and uh, talks about ketone supplements, ketone esters and ketone salts, um, the pluses, the minuses, um, questions and answers about all of that. So um, this book uh, was released uh, last week, and um, it's, so it's available now. I think it's coming out on Kindle in the beginning of March. <clears throat> and that is Steve, and um, I thank you all for listening to this webinar. Um, that's how you can contact me. I have a website with articles that I've written and with some of the scientific articles, you know, completely um, complete articles that you can look at. Uh, the hypothesis papers and some of the more recent studies for um, uh, about ketones. So thank you very much. And I'm ready for questions. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, the question says, do patients... Hey. Oh, okay, there you are. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, it was difficulty. <laughs> Any question from the audience here? You can text. Oh, I see okay, one. There's, uh, one. there's one question here. So... 
do patients need to take MCT or coconut oil for good because the effects aren't permanent? Do you have any comment for that, Dr. Newport? Yeah, yeah. I think um, um, if they start taking it, you know, to treat Alzheimer's or whatever, or if, you know, their aim is for possibly prevention, um, that they do need to, they need, need to take it consistently and just plan to make it part of their diet, um, you know, unless they are able to uh, do another ketogenic strategy that has the same kind of results. Um, I, um, <clears throat> I mean, it's possible to do a ketogenic diet without MCT or coconut oil. It just helps. It helps sustain the ketone levels. Um, but, you know, like um, I've had, you know, people a lot of them communicate with me over the years and they'll say, well, we kind of give it to her here and maybe a few days there, you know, and we're not really seeing anything. Well, you know, the brain needs fuel constantly 24 seven. And uh, if it's not getting glucose into those parts of the brain at one point, it won't be at other points either. And so, you know, those areas of the brain constantly need uh, a source of energy and, so I do think, you know, um, that it is a lifelong thing. It's not something you'll be able to go on, you know, take it for a while and then, oh, you won't need it anymore. I, I really think somebody who has Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or, you know, um, or wants to prevent those that they should continue, you know, taking it indefinitely. I, I have been taking it, using it for 11 years. It's just become a standard part of my diet now. <laughs> So Dr. Newport, I have a personal question for you. Continuing this question is, do you think it's possible if the people or patients stick to the ketogenic diet very strictly, is it possible to cure Alzheimer's disease or is it just a prevention eventually? Any comment well, on that? I, I think it can control the progress of it. You know, um, there was hope that the ketone ester, and it's possible, I mean, if, if somebody uses it early enough or, you know, say they're at risk for it and they don't have symptoms yet, I think it is possible that um, using a ketone ester or a ketogenic diet or some other ketone strategy, you know, could potentially um, push it off, delay it, or maybe keep it from, from happening altogether. Um, <clears throat> if you think about it, most people, most, my husband was an exception with early onset Alzheimer's, but most people are very elderly, you know, when they get it. And it's usually during the first last few years of their life. Um, if you can postpone it, uh, there was actually a speaker at one of the Alzheimer's Association conferences. And he said, if you could delay the onset of Alzheimer's by five years, you would cut the number of cases in half in the world, you know, because it is an end of life disease. <clears throat> so, um, you know, a strategy like this could really, it could, potentially prevent it happening in elderly people at the end of their life. Um, and younger people, you know, I think uh, people who are at risk for it um, should really consider doing, you know, uh, a ketogenic strategy, you know, some type of prevention. Um, ketone supplements, the level goes up and then it comes down over a few hours. It stays, you know, the ketone levels are in the blood for maybe four or five hours. Um, so you would have to take repeated doses of those. So, um, some of my rising stars, <laughs> my friends and who are doing ketone research, they tend to agree that, um, if you're going to use ketone supplements to consider combining it with a lower carb, higher fat diet, a more ketogenic kind of diet, they find that that seems to be the most effective at, um, you know, getting ketone levels up and helping to sustain, uh, ketone levels. So um, that's my advice, and, and that's you know what I do myself. Okay, actually, you kind of answer the second question for Christina. How mm -hmm. long do the BHB level can stay elevated after the ketone ester? I assume the answer with four to five hours. But is there any difference be, um, between the internal ketones or external ketone mm -hmm. ester or ketone salt for the? For the level in the blood or will be a little bit different or be similar? Yeah, so um, if you stay consistently on a ketogenic diet, your level will fluctuate a bit throughout the day, but it will stay elevated. Now, um, one very common phenomenon in the world of epilepsy 
of uh, people who are on the ketogenic diet is if you eat one meal or one snack that's high in carb and low in fat, you will blow out a ketosis like right away. You know, your ketone levels will plummet and it can take days to get back up to where you were before. Just one screw up like that. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's important for people that are using strictly diet for a medical reason to really try to sustain that and not not blow it by um, eating a high carb meal. They call it the birthday syndrome because the parents will feel sorry for their child and give them a piece of birthday cake. But their reward is that they get a seizure then, you know, it's it's bad. But um, but I do think, you know, in those situations. Um, I mean, I didn't talk about cancer much, but cancer cells take up. Um, glucose, they're greedy for glucose and they can't use ketones. They, um, the can cancer cells, um, Dr. Thomas Seafried and others have been studying this very intensively and every cancer they look at has abnormal mitochondria that ferment glucose instead of metabolizing it the normal way. Um, and um, they, these mitochondria cannot use glucose and th these are cancer cells. Some cancer cells take up 200 times more glucose than a normal cell. So um, that, that's how the, uh, the ketogenic diet can play a role in cancer, possibly controlling or slowing down or shrinking cancers. And there are many anecdotal reports, and now there are several human studies, actually a bunch of them starting throughout the world as an adjunct to other treatments for cancer. You know, uh, can we slow it down further? Can we um, get rid of the tumor completely? Uh, so hopefully we'll have answers to that soon. But it's, um, it's another situation where, um, there are some case reports of people that responded with like a very aggressive brain tumor, glioblastoma, uh, with ketogenic diet. Then I mean, we got to the point where they couldn't even find it on the MRI and it was quite a large tumor. But then when they resume a normal diet, the cancer finds that sugar and, uh, and it just grows back very quickly. Um, so it's for somebody with cancer is probably a lifelong, um, thing that if you want to keep the cancer away that you may have to, to stay on the diet. <laughs> okay, I think so we have a lot of uh, questions here. So I may pick several. Uh, uh, first one is from the room. Uh, are all the MCT oils are the same? So is any variations in type you will recommend or we should purchase from the audience? Yeah. Um, there's several different kinds available that the standard that's, you know, that was out there for many years that probably most companies have is mainly C8 and C10. It's like 60% C8 and 40% um, C10, almost just a little bit of C6 and a little tiny bit of C12. Um, so those are the standard ones out there. And actually that's um, one that I use quite a lot. Um, you, it is possible to get pure C8. There are several companies that sell that. Um, and that's the, um, the MCT that is in, is in the medical food, now called Axona. Um, and um, it is more ketogenic, um, but um, it's also more likely to cause diarrhea. So you have to be really careful with that one <laughs> um, if you're not used to it. Um, there are some other products out there that I actually like quite a lot um, and I use um, myself. Um, there, it's liquid coconut cooking oil. So um, for example, Carrington Farms has one. It's high in lauric acid. It's about 32% lauric acid um, and also has C8 and C10. And I like that because of that, you know, the antimicrobial properties of lauric acid we talked about and that it may stimulate ketone production directly in brain cells. And, this particular uh, product is going to be used in an Alzheimer study in Australia. Uh, they're going to be studying this. Uh, so um, there are several different types out there. So depending on what you're looking for, um, you might uh, consider, you know, different products of MCTs. And they're, they're powdered forms too, powdered and liquid forms out there. And uh, second question from the room is, uh, well, not a second. Uh, the next question: Does cooking with coconut oil has any benefit for the normal people, or uh, even for patients? Yeah, it's it can. That, that's the cool thing about it. I mean, it becomes a food. You don't have to just eat it like coconut oil. You know, I I always um, like for Steve. Uh, sometimes he would just drink it straight. You know, I started mixing coconut and MCT oil together and. 
found that a four to three ratio of MCT to coconut was liquid at room temperature. You could use it at almost any food, um, straight coconut oil. If you put it in something cold, it clumps up right away, like almost immediately. Um, so, um, you, so you have to put it in warm foods, but you know, I normally would try to incorporate it in the food and you can cook, um, you know, I mean, cultures and throughout the tropical areas have cooked, you know, included coconut oil, you know, as a staple in their diet, you know, for eons. And um, so there's many th different things you can do with it. And the, the cautions though, with cooking is that um, it's, you need to use a relatively lower temperature on the stove than you might, you know, be able to use with other kinds of oils. Um, the smoke point is low for coconut oil. So um, if you get over like 350 degrees, um, it will start to smoke and then you will ruin the, um, the oil. Um, so I tell people to kind of keep it at a low medium, um, heat, you know, on the stove, if they're going to cook with it and, um, don't let it get to the point of smoking and in the oven too, you know, like, um, you could usually, you can incorporate it into foods without too much trouble. But if you like for some, sometimes I'll, I'll make salmon and I'll paint it on top of the salmon, but, and 350 works perfectly. If you did 375, it would probably smoke and it would ruin the oil. Next question is, uh, actually you kind of talk about in the slides already, but just make sure people can understand more easily is, how do you incorporate MCT in the typical diet? Yeah, so um, some of the things I do with it, um, I cook a little bit with it. I, I like to make eggs in it, you know. Um, I, um, Put it, people use it in coffee or tea. That's one easy way to take it. I put it like on vegetables. Uh, so a lot of people put butter on their vegetables, you know. I put coconut oil on mine or the mixture, you know, the um, liquid coconut cooking oil sometimes. Um, I You can mix it into yogurt, cottage cheese, ricotta cheese, um, chili soup, you know. There's so many different ways. You can put it on your salad, make it part of your salad dressing works beautifully that way. So just many different things that you can use it for in the food. <clears throat> uh, I believe you talk about this. Next question is any effect of MCT diet on brain tumor or brain cancer? I believe you shortly talk about that. Do you have more comment for this? Yeah, um, it's being um, studied intensively. Um, Dr. Thomas Seafried from Boston College kind of got this ball rolling. He's actually a geneticist <laughs> and um, but he's the, you know, he's kind of steered away now from the, the genetic theories of cancer, you know, and discovered really, um, it's called the Warburg effect, it was, which was discovered back in the 1930s, but kind of put on the back burner um, that, you know, cancer cells ferment glucose. And um, the group at University of South Florida, uh, which is close to me, I, I live near Tampa, um, they've been intensively studying cancer um, in response to ketogenic diets, glucose lowering um, substances along with it, um, ketone esters, ketone salts, um, they're studying and hyperbaric oxygen in combination with those, they're studying combinations. They've had some remarkable results. Um, just, you know, uh, giving mice, well, these are mice, you know, with glioblastoma, some of them completely, it seems to completely eliminate the cancer. And um, Dr. Adrian Sheck out in Phoenix has been studying, um, the combination of ketogenic diet and um, ketone salts with um, radiation for glioblastoma and her studies are in mice as well and um, she uh, has found that the combination can greatly prolong life and uh, she even had one one group of mice that um, I believe they got the ketone salts plus ketogenic diet and radiation and uh, they got to the end of their lifespan <laughs> and had not died it was quite remarkable and then they decided to feed them put them back on a standard diet and then they passed away as the other mice had you know but that but the cancer didn't come back in those uh, those particular mice it was very interesting work that should be published soon yeah mm -hmm. very interesting yeah uh, last question from my screen okay uh, it's kind of change the topic is for premature newborns uh, do you think the reason why MCT can help the weight gain is because the quickly absorption or because uh, the chain length or other factors like the ketone play a role in the weight gain? Any comments for that? 
I think it's probably all of the above. <laughs> it is absorbed very easily and quickly by the newborn. And um, the uh, the newborn, uh, Dr. Kunane, again, you know, from Canada that does the ketone and glucose PET scans, um, he, before studying Alzheimer's, he studied the newborns. And what he found was that longer chain fats are actually converted to ketones um, before they enter the brain or as they enter the brain and that the ketones become the building blocks for the cholesterol and the lipids that are in the brain. It's very interesting, very interesting work. And so, you know, since, uh, you know, MCTs are ketogenic, it seems like that could help contribute to that process and provide energy, um, you know, to the newborn brain and all the cells in the body. You know, ketones, you know, except the liver, you know, all of the other organs can use ketones. So um, I've had, you know, um, uh, a few uh, parents of children with autism that have told me when they added MCT oil to their child child's diet, they started growing much better. You know, it was very interesting and doing better in school and things like that. You know, uh, I've heard, you know, anecdotal, not studies, but, you know, hopefully, you know, some of these studies will take place. I have another one. Probably I missed when I brought the questions. Uh, it's from EOCS. Why mm -hmm. do you think this strategy overall have not gained the mainstream attention? Ah. Uh, <laughs> 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 Things take time, and um, it actually the keto diet has really gone crazy the last couple of years. There are so many new books. You know, I'm looking my my book uh, just came out, and there are so many keto books out there now. Um, but uh, you know, it's just like doctors, for example. It often will take 50 years from the time there's a discovery until it's implemented, implemented, recognized. You know. The first reaction that well we need studies you know and then you have to wait years for studies yeah. and um, when it's Alzheimer's in the meantime you've lost most of your patients you know um, but you know sometimes it just takes uh, people to push it along and um, I credit you know Jim Abrams of the Charlie Foundation um, of really uh, giving a big push in the 1990s you know, his son responded to this diet. He had five neurologists. He had taken his son, we're talking to world-class facilities um, to be evaluated and treated. And not one of them mentioned the ketogenic diet to him as an option. Um, and I, you know, I knew about it. Um, I, w I learned about it in my training. And I, and I remember having a child when I was uh, doing my residency that was on a ketogenic diet for epilepsy. Um, but um, neurologists, felt it was uh, in, uh, an unpalatable diet and that it might have side effects. You know, the children maybe didn't grow quite as well, but heck if it stops you from having a hundred seizures a day, you know, uh, maybe well worth it. So um, he wanted to make sure other parents knew about it. So we started the Charlie Foundation to get the message out to tell every everybody he possibly could, you know, that this, um, ketogenic diet was an option for children who weren't responding to medications. And he happens to be a Hollywood director. He, he directed some comedies um, in the 90s and beyond. And he made a, a movie with Meryl Streep called First Do No Harm. It's a, an amazing, it was a made for TV movie to try to get the message out. Um, and, you know, it's been slowly growing since the 1990s, this awareness um, as his information has gotten out. And then um, you know, people like Dr. Kunane. Um, I've tried my darndest to get this message out since 2008. And um, I think it's just um, with the advent now, of the availability of ketone supplements, you know, since 2016, um, that, you know, this message has been getting out to more and more people that people are starting to look at this as a possibility. I mean, just healthy everyday people find that, you know, taking exogenous supplements, they, they say that they have better mental focus, mental clarity, they sleep better, you know, um, uh, some of them find it much easier to lose weight, you know, taking them, you know, those kind of things are happening. So it's getting out to the mainstream. I think the biggest push is because of the availability now of these exogenous supplements that people can take. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Newport. Uh, I saw another Another question. Um, well, actually, I can have answer, but I'll let you do that first. 
The MCP oil available in the market are from coconut oil or from palm kernel oil or from any other sources or synthesized? Um, yeah, the two, the two biggest sources, the two usual are coconut or palm kernel oil. Um, it doesn't always say on the bottle where, where they extracted it from. So if you want to know that one way or the other, you may need to contact the manufacturer. Now I have, um, um, there was a, there, there's a company that produces these and I got to test it for myself. This is MCT oil, 60, 40, 60% C8 and C, you know, 40% C10 from coconut. And here it is from palm kernel oil. They taste exactly the same and biochemically they've tested it. And it's exactly the same, you know, it's the same oil regardless of where they get it from. They, they can decide um, in large part how, what percentage of each, you know, to put in the product, you know, the C8 and C10 and, you know, whatever else they're using, they've developed this capability recently. Um, but, um, you know, I, <laughs> I'm not sure that there is a great difference, you know, uh, some people just prefer from coconut oil. There's some some things about um, concerns about how palm kernel oil is farmed, um, but that that's uh, something that's um, uh, they're starting to get certifications for farmers to make sure they have good practices and that type of thing. These companies are working for that. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, since it really is in the industry, so I get uh, I get some comments here. Um, both coconut and palm kernel oil do contain carbon-8 to carbon-12 fatty acid, but from the economic standpoint, palm kernel oil is more cheaper than coconut. Uh, that makes sense, actually. Yeah. Um, actually, most of the MCT actually is synthesized because uh, they can, it's very hard to fractionate the, M, the triacid glucose directly. So typically the way, I don't know, I, I cannot guarantee everybody, but typically economic way in the large scale, they will hydrolyze the coconut oil or palm kernel oil into free fatty acids. Then they fractionate it into carbon-8 and carbon-10 um, enriched uh, fraction and then do the acidification later on to have the MCT oil. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there's a marketing way to do this, but scientifically today I'm coordinating this webinar. So I'm, I'm going to be scientifically sure my experience it is uh, by uh, chemical synthesis or some uh, lipase catalyzed reactions going on there. But uh, mm -hmm. for this kind of information, I don't think it's very transparent to the consumers or mm -hmm. even to the customers, uh, but be aware. Um, and uh, I want to say that and actually for my side, from Bunky's side, also we are working on something quite new. It's more uh, avoid natural synthesized MCTs or related oils. So we hope we can launch very soon in the market. So we can talk more on that in the future. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other questions from the audience before we close the study sessions? Because it's kind of a little bit over time, but uh, I really enjoyed the talk from Dr. Newport. Personally, uh, I hope the older audience does the same thing too. Uh, any other questions? I'll give another one minute before we close the whole session. And just from AOCS, I would like to Thank both Dr. Newport and Joe. We really appreciate your time and taking the time to so thoroughly cover this um, topic. And it's, um, I think it's very, one, inspirational um, and two, helpful um, for everyone. And uh, thank you so much for, for giving us this time. Oh, you're very welcome. I appreciate yeah. the opportunity out there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I appreciate too. Yeah. I need to do this. I really appreciate it help get this message out. <laughs> uh, last but not least, I uh, had a comment um, because this, if, if your co-workers or some people missing a part of the presentation, I believe, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, this whole presentation is a video, a record, recorded, so it can be found from AOCS website somewhere, right? That's correct. Um, it'll be available to all the participants um, next week, and we will send you an email with a link to the recording. And after that, it will be archived on AOCS.org backslash webinar. Perfect. Hey, well, I don't think we have more questions. Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to close it out, but thank you, everybody.
um, for thank attending and, and thank you to those who presented for us. Oh, you are very welcome. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Newport. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.